everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers, Drs. Reed Blackwelder and Brian Cross, to deliver the keynote address, Tipping Points Influencing Interprofessional Care and Education. Dr. Blackwelder is Professor and Interim Chair at the Department of Family Medicine in the Quillen College of Medicine at East Tennessee State University and holds the distinction of being a past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Brian Cross is the Associate Chair and Vice Chair of the Department of Family Practice at Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy. Um, he's an Associate Professor at the Department of Family Medicine in the Quillen College of Medicine and he's the Director of Interprofessional Education and Research. Doctors. Ah, there we go. Before we do anything, we, ha we haven't done this for a while. Come, come. Ah, okay. yeah. yes, so, yes. Yes, uh, selfie time. <laughs> okay, I've got to get in there. There they are. Okay, that will be your life. Thank you. How many of you, how many of you are tweeting? Thank you. Please tweet some more. We finally determined the hashtag. It's cumbersome. I'm sorry, well, it's not cumbersome, but it's H-C-S-I-E-T-S-U-I-P-E, uh, yeah. -E -E. sorry. We were trying to make sure we recognized everybody, so if you have no idea what that means, don't worry about it. it it's all good. So, uh, so it's not hashtag cumbersome. No, no, I was tempted by that, but okay. we, we decided not to. Um, we've already been warned that if we go outside a certain range, we will be shot. If you notice, we don't stand behind podiums, so we're behaving, yes. Very good. So uh, we're here to talk, and so we're going to move on from this to, to other things. So one really important aspect of interprofessional education is trying to figure out some things like, how many of you think global warming may or may not be a thing? By the way, I put may or may not. That means you can all raise your hands. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to go into aspects of that, but there's global warming, of which there might be evidence. There might be evidence about vaccines, but depending on what country you come from, there may be more questions about evidence about vaccines. How many people think vaccines are a good thing for public health? Oh good, we know our audience. Thank you, yeah, that's reassuring, <laughs> thank goodness. And then we have, because we know our audience as well, how many of you think interprofessional team-based care is good? Okay, that, you were way slow on mm. that. That was a little disturbing. <laughs> There's no trick question on that, um, because this is really one reason we're here, is that this is an important thing and this is the choir. Um, then the question becomes, so I think with all three of these, there is debate on how much evidence exists versus how much evidence is needed to agree that we need to move in that direction. I think in the first two uh, cases, there has been clear debate uh, on different sides of, of a discussion um, of the relevance of those two things. And I think we could agree that there is um, a similar kind of discussion and debate about the how much evidence is needed or how much currently exists to um, prove the use of team-based care improves outcomes both of patients and I would argue of provider quality of life. So uh, who are we? Um, we realize that uh, we meet the definition of an expert because we have flown in from somewhere else <laughs> We have a PowerPoint presentation, and I have a beard, <laughs> a gray beard, so I really qualify uh, as an expert. But we realize that's probably not enough, uh, so we thought we would kind of share a little bit about who we are and, and why. So the Quillen College of Medicine was started in 1974. By U.S. standards, it's, it's quite young. By your standards, it's, it's infantile um, when you look at how long we've been around. But it's a, it's a school that was dedicated with a mission of providing care and, and creating the physicians our region needed, which is Appalachia. So that was the, the College of Medicine. Um, you've already heard of the Kellogg Grant. I got to ETSU in 1992, so just as this was happening, I'm not sure if the deans were still sequestered in their meeting, but it seemed as if they were, and so I uh, got together. And, and so I've been a part of this ongoing effort toward interprofessional education since I got there in, in 92. You've already heard a great story from Dean Emeritus Calhoun about the founding creation establishment of the Gatton College of Pharmacy. Again, much like the Quillen College of Medicine, um, infantile in comparison to how long we've been in existence. Um, founded in 2005, first class, uh, graduating in 2010. We added 
gotten to a now existing five college academic health science center that includes medicine, pharmacy, public health, nursing, and the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Services. That also includes the departments of clinical psychology and social work. Um, all told, there are uh, upwards of 15 different training programs within the Academic Health Science Center. And then on top of that is this is the Health Resources and Services Administration. Uh, we all live in the world of acronyms. This is called HRSA. Um, and a HRSA grant is the U.S. government's way of, of funding innovative processes and projects. And so I'm very honored that um, my department, uh, Department of Family Medicine, our Department of Pediatrics, um, received a joint grant recently, of, about two and a half years ago. We're, we're about to start our third year of a five-year grant to help us figure out a sustainable interprofessional healthcare teaching and delivery model. So the goal is we get a certain amount of money for uh, a set amount of time, and in the, <laughs> three more years from now, we're supposed to be totally self-sustaining. No pressures uh, whatsoever, but it really is an opportunity to do some good work, um, and that's happening in our department. It was previously mentioned um, <clears throat> by uh, Dr. Bishop that uh, we were recently recognized as one of 23 incubator sites by the National Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education through the University of Minnesota. And likewise, our Academic Health Science Center was also chosen as one of a small group that is a beta site for the um, American Association of Health Centers. Um, this is the academic side of health centers. And the purpose of this is to align the, the community, the practitioners, with the academic side and to create over a year um, time span, create a, a process that will blend what is happening in practice and what is happening in education so that there is cl clear symbiotic relationships in those two communities. And so when you look at all of those things together, a very important point relates to the topic of our presentation, which is tipping points, and we'll refer to that several times. The last two-ish years have seen a, what I would say is a remarkable acceleration of a project that's been in place for uh, over 30. And so the, the HRSA grant that came to our clinical departments, the Nexus Incubation Center and the, and the beta site recognition are all within a, an amount of time and we're hoping and feeling like this is a tipping point for us to really move forward. Another reason I, I think we're here is that we seem to be onto something um, and now we just have to ride the wave. Uh, of that. Um, so, I wanted to tell you stories because I'm a, I'm a family physician. Are there any other general practitioners or physicians in the room? Thank you, good. So we're the tokens. I like that. So, yeah, we represent. Um, so I, I'm here uh, basically because uh, I never wanted to be a physician. I, and I can say it comfortably in this room. I think many physicians, especially back then, were jerks. Um, that's not a scientific phrase, but there was just a, there was a, a strange attitude, at least in the U.S., because of a, a patriarchal system. Um, again, back when I was going to medical school, I went to a school where they didn't have family medicine. So I, I trained in a very interesting way, uh, but I suddenly woke up and realized, oh my God, what am I going to do with my college degree? And this seemed the thing to do. Um, and I've been blessed to be able to do that. Um, I'll try to uh, also identify all these acronyms, because I know we live on these. Um, what I ended up doing is doing medicine at Emory, down, uh, which is uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually a, a Georgia native, Atlanta native. And I went to Emory. And I had a very hard time making a decision because at some point after our medical school, you have to decide on your specialty. Um, so as I said, they didn't have family medicine. I had no idea what that was, um, but I know that every rotation I loved. And I finally ended up on an experience with somebody who on one day, my first day with him as a medical student, he uh, rounded in the nursing home, went to the hospital, took care of someone having an acute heart attack, went back to the office, did an in-office vasectomy, um, did some other stuff. And I basically stopped at one point and said, what are you? Because he was a family physician, a general practitioner. Um, and I'd never been exposed to that. So that's, that's what I ended up falling in love with. So then the National Health Service Corps was a way the United States would recognize people. Um, they would provide training and some of the costs of our education in exchange for service in underserved areas. So the National Service Corps was designed to make sure that places that didn't have care could get some. And I went to a small town called Trenton, Georgia, 
Um, a lot of the places in that part of Georgia were named after uh, cities in the UK. Um, so I was in, in Trenton, uh, and it was a town of 1,400. It's a very small place. I was born in Atlanta, went to college in Philadelphia, which is also large, and ended up practicing in Trenton. Uh, loved it. Fell in love, and I love small towns ever since. So I, I was there for four years. And what was interesting about that, and I'll refer to this again, is I ended up in this small town. I was the only physician for two and a half years. But there were, uh, importantly, there was a pharmacy. Um, there was also a health department. There was an EMS station. We ended up with a physical therapy practice, of all things, and two chiropractors. Um, and so at the time, even though we didn't have the acronym that we'll talk about later uh, and didn't have grants for it, I kind of was the community physician and we created a, a way of taking care of our patients. I would routinely get a call from someone who said, I saw your uh, so-and-so the other day, I think they need to see you. Um, and we knew who that was. This was before electronic records and things like that. We actually used this weird thing called a telephone. Yeah, actually, I'm very fascinated. You know, these, do you know these things can call people? Really? It is. It's, they're not just for pictures and tweeting. They actually, yeah. So, and, and I know that seems weird, but many of us grew up at a time where our technology was different. And then I ended up in 1992. Um, my parents were both teachers, and I, I felt something was lacking. There were no medical students where I was. There was not a residency program for training. Uh, there was not a college of pharmacy. It was me and my patients, and that was special but I didn't have the teacher. That's something I always felt drawn to. So in 92, I ended up coming to the Quillen College of Medicine, and that's where I've been uh, ever since. Um, I will share before he tells one of his stories that I, uh, I'll come back to this issue of relationships, and we would periodically run into each other, um, and I, I started developing a relationship and began to nag. So, and we'll come to, to what happened with that nagging shortly. Uh, but then uh, uh, Brian's stories. So uh, likewise, I didn't want to be a pharmacist. Uh, I wanted to be a rock and roll star. Uh, you see how that ended up. Um, so when all of this came to fruition, when uh, one, one summer I woke up literally in the back of a van with three other musicians and realized um, there wasn't a good retirement plan uh, in that and came back home after my rock and roll career in Boston didn't work so well and went into pharmacy um, and um, through that ended up in a residency in Boston, Massachusetts in a 1200 bed hospital that took up four city blocks in center city Boston. Um, learned great things so small town boy from West Virginia moved to the big city of Boston and learned uh, how to interact with Harvard trained physicians it was a great jumping into the deep end very quickly from there I left and decided um, to as we say in America go west young man and I went to Arizona which is about as far away from Boston as you could get I had been drawn for many years of my life um, to the Native American and so there the IHS is the Indian Health Service. So this is a government-run health um, initiative that was created as a result of um, what happened to the Native peoples of America. And so there, I um, learned about healthcare being provided to a population of great need, um, of great um, inequity. And I also met my future wife. Um, so. I went from a 1,200-bed hospital to a 12-bed hospital that was managed outside of a, a small <laughs> elementary school. I became the <coughs> director of inpatient services for 12 beds. I, I then helped to establish a clinic that was a single wide trailer. The pharmacy that I worked from at that point was three feet by six feet. Yup. I had a Dutch door, the top always remained open, the bottom remained closed, and all of my discussions with patients happened at that point of practice and care. My wife, who was the GP in the clinic, was two doors down, and so if anything was needed, we were in constant communication. We lear I learned very quickly in environments like that that everybody must be at the height of their ability because you didn't know what was coming at any particular time. I had to do things that I don't think most pharmacists 
would expect when they were in school, like intubation and doing codes and, and such, because that was just what was required. The person who did our phlebotomy was also the person who emptied the trash and swept the floors. Everybody had multiple jobs. So early on in my career, I learned that being part of a team meant doing a whole lot of things that you may not be necessarily comfortable for, or perhaps even trained for. But it was the ability to remove yourself from the ego and um, understand that the patient was at the center. I think the other thing that I learned in that place was that every time a prescription came to the pharmacy, it came long before computers in a large manila folder, bless you. And within that manila folder was the entire history of the patient. So when you open that folder up, on the right-hand side was everything that had ever happened to that patient in the ambulatory setting. And when you open the left side, it was everything that happened in the ER in the hospital. So when I was filling prescriptions, I knew exactly the same information that the person who prescribed the, the medicine for that day knew as well. And I said to myself, this just makes sense. We should all share the same information. Graham articulated beautifully that probably one of the major problems in all of our systems is the inability to share information across disciplines. It was at that moment that I realized this is just the way practice ought to be. And so um, fast forward several years later and I uh, was talked by multiple people in dark um, rooms, uh, I'll explain later. Um, I was convinced to move from another institution to the Gatton College of Pharmacy um, and met this wonderful man two years prior, probably maybe three, began working with him, not in any formal way, yeah. but because of our common goal of educating a group of, a group of students in a particular way and taking care of patients in a particular way, we found ways of working together even though both of our employers didn't actually have a relationship with each other. Yeah. And this is key as we go through because we want you to leave with something practical. And so a recurring theme is you don't have to wait necessarily for memos. You can, you can do things yourself. And it, it was really important because I was recruiting him for a while and it didn't work. Um, but then he went to the College of Pharmacy and I was actually able to make it happen then. Uh, because one of, the, one of the things that did happen is in my resident, at that time I was a program director, so I was in charge of the clinic training the family medicine residents. So those who graduated medical school who wanted to be family docs would spend three years, and I was a program director for about 14 years. The normal lifespan is about four years. So I don't know what's wrong with me, but I, I stayed there. And part of the joy was I was able to get Brian to be part of our practice as an embedded pharmacist. And this is important as you look at some of the successes we've had because it's a start of a, a model. Um, some of the realities in the United States, I put a lot of these things in quotes on purpose. Um, healthcare system, we had a famous newscaster many years ago who, uh, who's, who would always refer to it in quotes. He would say, it's not about health, it's not very caring, and it's not much of a system. And I'm afraid that's really where the U.S. process has been, and still is. I mean, we, we do have um, the Affordable Care Act, which is the name of the law that is still law. Some people call that Obamacare. Um, but it was a very com complex and cumbersome, there's our hashtag, uh, cumbersome process that was crippled uh, because of partisan politics. So what was passed had a lot of things that everybody should like, but because we were past the point of communication and dealing with, with uh, trying to make something better, it really hasn't worked well. That's been a real problem for us. Um, in, in our country, because of a number of things, we, um, we don't have, uh, I think, an agreement that health care is a right. We don't have access across the board to basic health care, uh, regardless of how it's paid. That was part of what the ACA the Affordable Care Act was trying to do. Uh, it hasn't succeeded well, so we have fee for service. I know that's a, a common model. It, it basically just means in order to get paid, I have to do something. And if I want to get paid more, I do more things. I mean, it's not quite that simple, and it's not, that's not the reason for doing it. But when you're basing a system of payment in, in say it's a service profession, you get some kind of bizarre incentives. And so that's really been part of our problem and why our system has cost so much for such poor outcomes. And that's really what we're dealing with, is, is the recognition that much of what we do is we use the term siloed and fragmented. That people are working in isolation, even when you're not. 
or you think you're working together, we're gonna, we're gonna challenge you that a lot of times what looks like team-based care is still just many silos within. Um, as one quick example in the first, as we had you embedded working with us trying to figure out what that meant, a lot of times the physicians would say, you have a complicated history of medications, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Cross see you. Well, and all of a sudden he would get this patient to work on in isolation, although we never did quite in isolation, but uh, that was still a potential model. So how do we break that down is really important. Um, in the United States, this is called the triple aim, but what it refers to is the healthcare outcomes of our patients are usually, depending on which number you look at, compared with the rest of the world at 37 or so. It's never getting any higher than that. So we're about 37 in outcomes. No one's satisfied with our system. Our patients are not, our providers are not. Um, and it's done at incredibly high cost. We, we spend two to three times as much as any other developed country for what we call healthcare and yet for outcomes that are 37. This has been a motivator for a lot of the change and a lot of the grants that, that we're taking advantage of. If somebody says, we can't keep doing this, it, it's really not sensible. Um, and I'm putting debate in quotes because uh, how many of you occasionally follow some of the headlines about the United States political system? Yeah, very little of that is de debate. It's yelling, it's lines in the sand, it's, it's bullying, it's calling people names. It's not the kind of discussion one would expect of the leaders of your country. And I'm talking both sides. Everybody is in this and it's, it's really sad. And I put healthcare in quotes because it's still not healthcare. Um, we're very good at, at disease management. Uh, well, and we're not even that good at some of it. I shouldn't even say that. We're good at identifying disease and having anti-things, uh, but we're not very good at actually managing it. So this is part of our challenge. We have a system that's totally dysfunctional. Um, <clears throat> lately, and I put patient-centered in quotes, how many of you have heard the concept, the patient-centered medical home, PCMH? Okay, I see a few nods, but very few hands going up. So this is one of the acronym buzzwords in, in the United States that if you put this in a grant application, you're immediately looked at more seriously. How many of you do grant applications? Okay, so you know the power of buzzwords. What's the word right now? Put it in your grant somewhere because people will then say, oh, this is what we want. Well, PCMH is, is that kind of thing in our country. We, we talk about it with varying degrees of meaning. Um, it's often just a checkbox. Um, so it's one of those buzzwords, but it really does relate to something. However, it does not reflect our systems. So as a quick example, my, all my residency programs are uh, PCMH, level three qualified, that's a good thing. Yay, we checked the box. But that doesn't mean a patient can actually come in when they want or be seen when they want, and that's truly patient-centered. A lot of what we do is all about me. You know, when am I around? When can my practice be available? Even though I'm PCMH. This is one of our challenges, is how do we blend the checkbox to a reality? And that's really what we're struggling with right now. Everything we do is uh, uh, practice or practitioner-centered. And the latest catchphrase is team-based care. That's another reason you get grants and money, is you throw team-based care in there now. Um, and again, I'm, I'm saying that in a way we actually mean it. Okay, trust me, I'm, I'm not being that cynical. We actually are living and breathing this. But I will tell you that in our discussions with others, a lot of what we see as team-based care, quite frankly, is co-located care, people in the same place, their silos, and other things. So this is a real challenge because now what happens with a buzzword is the moment you hear it, most people roll their eyes or go, yeah, right. And so we're trying to stay ahead of the curve in what we're doing in this. But this is a lot of what we're trying to do here. So the current team, if you think about, <clears throat> at least from the American model, if you think about pharmacy and medicine, so I'm the first to recognize that I have been amazingly blessed at the opportunities that I have been afforded. I've not filled a prescription since 1993. Um, I tell all of my students, uh, trust me, you don't want me to fill a prescription now. I would be very unsafe. What I have done is be embedded with in multiple different kinds of practices, primary care, internal medicine, cardiology, endocrinology, et cetera. But, but what I realized is that's, as Graham also said very well, the first thing he said was, this is wonderful and great and it's not where everything is, right? Yeah. So the reality is that where most of our pharmacists practice in the United States and where most of our physicians practice in the United States have no great way of communicating together. 
There is no interoperability between their systems of management, whatever those are. Their computers do not talk to one another. Um, currently, if a patient at uh, the Kingsport Family Medicine Clinic is admitted, we put something in the computer EMR system, print it off, and fax it to the hospital so that they can then put it into their computer system. And then when that patient is discharged and to come back to the clinic, the same thing is done. It's printed off and faxed down to our uh, clinic. I don't know about you, but that sounds just completely preposterous. And the really bizarre thing is, it's my patient to my team, so it's the same physicians. So even though we can work together, we can't communicate through the records. And for that reason, I think one of the things when we begin to discuss team-based care and truly have a commitment to that is that the ability, so we go back to 1991 when I moved to San Carlos, Arizona to the 12-bed hospital. And back then where we had no computers, but we all had, we all had the same amount of information and the exact process to look at that information. So everybody shared the same knowledge. And therefore the team, it's a whole lot easier to talk about the patient in common places when we all know the same pieces of information together. So when that's not possible, silos are easily reinforced because there's a system over here and I'm looking at that, but I'm not looking at the whole picture. There's a system over here and I'm looking at this, but it's a different picture. And unless we have a, a much more improved system to allow those things to talk together, those silos are just continually reinforced. So I think the other thing to, to grapple with is Team-based care requires some people to step outside of boxes of comfort. And at least in the United States, 60% of family physicians or GPs are employed. That means that they do not run their own place. They are employed by a larger health system. I do not have the statistics, but I would venture to say that the statistics for pharmacists are much even higher than that as far as being employed. The reason we bring this up is the idea of the mentality of an employee versus the mentality of a practitioner needs to be distinguished. When I feel like I'm an employee, I often feel like my voice is not, as, is not loud enough. It will not make enough influence. I maybe even am fearful to speak up about something because as being an employee, I must be in line with the company that I'm employed by. And so those employee mentalities we have to recognize we have to be aware of. And we have to realize that just because we're an employee doesn't mean that um, being an influencer is not possible. Finally, with, within our system, I think something to, to keep in mind and another reason that we have problems with communication between pharmacists and, and physicians, at least in our uh, model, we have problems with faxes, prior authorizations, which means getting a medication approved because unlike here, there's a whole lot of obstacles to make sure things don't get paid for. And those are done oftentimes. Is this being recorded? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oops. We may not be able to go home. Right. But, uh... um, and those obstacles often come from the payer, from the insurance company. And therefore, um, it changes this whole um, mindset and causes more obstacles, both for the patients and for the people that are trying to take care of the patients. If we agree, and I just watched this happen with a mother who was recently admitted to the hospital and watched how things were done to her, but things were not done with her. Care was provided to her and if I hadn't been there to almost like a mediator between the team and the system and the person having these things done too, I'm not sure if she would have been able to leave and understand what was happening. And I think that's certainly the problem. So these, these things then cause a problem to um, di divert care. And it, it, we would like to think that we are focused on outcomes. But many times we are doing things to check boxes and to make sure that the, our employee responsibilities are met. And if we happen to accidentally align those two things and the patient gets great care, 
that's marvelous. Unfortunately, I think we would all agree that our systems are not necessarily always aligned with what's best for the patient. It's often aligned with what's best for the system. Yeah. I think we've already talked about this, sadly. It, it sounds good, but it's often a checkbox. And so what we're really working on are some changes. I think some of this, yeah, we're, we're both So we've kind of mentioned this, and can you go to the next thing? Sure. So I, the, the two things that, that have come about as a result of the Affordable Care Act is a, is a change in the discussion to say, we need to stop being interventional yeah. and be prevention. And so the design of what that, that legislation was getting at and the, and the discussion that it was trying to create was changing delivery models so that care resided in a place this seems common sense, but it certainly is much more disjointed than what we would like to believe. And it, therefore, and I think we would all agree, the way to get people to do something is to put money there, whether that's grants or payment or reimbursement, et cetera. And so payment models are in the process of change to look more toward quality outcome measures being addressed as opposed to quantity. So as as Reed said before, if I do this, I get paid. If I do this times two, I get paid times two. So instead of that being the model, the model is now moving toward the quality. And as you can imagine, defining what quality is in medicine is much more difficult than what we thought in the theoretical phase 10 years ago. But that's where we would like to go. So the discussion about if a person gets readmitted 30 days then there is no reimbursement for that hospitalization. So as, as soon as money starts entering the picture, I think we would all agree that you can change discussion. The discussion that's happening is this pay for value versus volume. So pay for volume right now in the United States, you see more, you're paid for doing more, but it's not a very healthy model. Paying for value sounds good, but the trouble is how do you define value? So a lot of these terms are part of our insurance processes, chronic care management, per member per month to take care of it. So don't worry too much about those details, but that's relating to the system we're trying to navigate. Right. And, and what the goal is, as we said, is that we're trying to move, imagine a whole system that for years has been incentivized by doing things instead of providing care. And we're, so therefore, as you can imagine, it's like steering a very, very large ship. And that's what we in America are dealing with. I think we all agree in concept. I think moving that ship toward outcomes, how to measure it and how to pay for it is um, where the debate is. And we hope to discuss a little bit about that. So what we want to do is sort of talk a little bit about what we are doing with that as a foundation. So this is the outside of, of one of my three residencies, the Kingsport building. It took me 25 years to get a new building made or, or, or committed to. Um, that's another story. It's beautiful. Looks really good. It looks traditional. This is where care is provided. And in fact, when you come in as a patient, and by the way, just for, for patient security, that is not a real patient. The person playing the patient is a nurse, so nothing's being violated here. But uh, that looks like a typical kind of interaction. There's providers there, there's a patient um, that's going on. What, what you don't know, however, is this is really a representation of some of our interprofessional teams in action. And this is based on what really happens. The patient's in the room, and the uh, woman sitting in the chair is one of the pharmacy residents, and the gentleman standing is one of our family physician residents. So these are two resident trainees who are initially with the patient with none of us in the room. So the attendings, the physicians and pharmacy faculty are outside and will be engaged. And you got to experience some of this. So to stop me if I say something wrong. But uh, so, it's, so it's kind of fun because you're inside the black box. You have learners in there with nobody watching. Um, and yet this is part of that helping you develop autonomy, making decisions come out and present to us. So this is really not typical in a lot of places, but you got to know what the roles are, a big part of interprofessional care. I think similar. But, um, so yesterday I took a walk through um, Trinity and this just amazing, beautiful, you just look at this place and feel smarter, right? You just, you walk through the center part. I want one of those Harry Potter robes to just kind of walk around and, yeah. you know, I, uh, I don't. I, really th I don't think it would work, would it? I really would be smarter. You need but the beard. I do need the beard. Okay, um, but think, 
So in, in that same place, this is our version at ETSU. So in each of those buildings, I would argue those are silos. So one's a biology building and one's an English building, right? And however, what is different if you look inside of one of those is, is this collection of students who are coming together as groups and working together as, as these different learners we discussed before to solve a series of different kinds of problems. So again, just like on the left side, what looks what we would expect on the, on the outside will fool you and we hope to create a different environment and a different community of both learners and care in, inside. And that word is really important because what we're talking about is a new way of looking at patient-centered home and team-based care. It really should be community-based. And that's what I was referring to when I was in Trenton, Georgia. We had community-based care before we had an acronym. But it's really important that our learners start to understand the power they have as individuals when they move on into the world. Because right now, communities are having a hard time. And there seems to be some inherent animation that is going crazy here. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how much of that I can kill. Um, so part of this is we're trying to, to work with folks. As we talk about bow ties, you see my colleague is wearing a bow tie. Um, it just gave us something fun to play with in terms of analogy. I'm not, because you can't see them. <laughs> a bow tie hides. Um, but what we're looking at is we have to pay attention to our training model at the same time we pay attention to our, our practice model. So we're training and caring for patients. And so part of my job is to do some assessment. And I look at a number of variables in different ways um, to include all of these things you see to generate possibilities. What could be going on? Now part of this is what could be going on for my patients, which is key, However, I also have to pay attention to what's going on for my learners as they're developing these skills. So I have to be challenging, um, as I'm helping us get through to patient-centeredness, what my patient needs, I'm having to pay attention to the training component and developing our learners in a team-based fashion because I'm hopeful that you were involved in some generations of what could be going on. So like you got right in the middle of a couple of things. Not quite, didn't do an intubation though, did you? Oh, see, there we go. So come, come to, we'll do intubations <laughs> together. Um, and then at the middle of that with the patient learners, then some other things happen. So this discussion came out of a, a series of uh, interactions that Reed and I and other um, faculty had in family medicine, where we started talking about um, how these different professions are trained and, and how their minds think and approach patients. So, what I've seen being married to a physician now for 25 years, they approach patients as a group of, of problems, right? And they come to this, as, as Rita said very well, to, to this center diagnosis. Now, it's not all they do, but that's how we train that thought process. In pharmacy, we train exactly the opposite. We assume that our diagnostician colleagues have done everything perfectly and wonderfully. And we, we take that diagnosis and we say, I'm going to apply the same school of thought to individualizing a therapy regimen for that patient based on these things that you have addressed for me. And so we just came to this realization that if you put those two people together symbiotically in a relationship where they are allowed to practice without egos on the table and allowed to use the best of them, um, that the people that are at the center will get the best. So as we look at this, um, just to restate that, there's sort of this natural team member, especially between pharmacy and medicine, because we're working on educating the providers and the practitioners, and we're taking all these variables, hopefully with this undifferentiated process. That's what I'm trying to do, is to take something that seems uncertain and work toward uh, a common answer, hopefully to be fairly clear when I say, here's what I think. Um, but that's really a lot of my process coming to an answer which I put in quotes because we've all gotten that process of whoops wasn't quite the right answer but as long as we're thinking in terms of possibilities and we have them all listed we're in good shape um, and so because of that the natural team person is, is my colleague and I, and I think as it was stated multiple times actually we could have just stopped with Graham because he um, just amazingly described how in this setting, if um, you do not have the pressure upon you that you have to respond and you have to be right, 
that you actually contribute much more as a result. And so um, having that coming to the pharmacist and saying, so what do you think the best regimen for this is? And this isn't about, uh, let's make sure you're right. This is, let's make sure that we do the right thing for this person who is somebody's grandmother. Yeah. So. Yeah, we'll go for that. So one example, um, hopefully I'm getting to, to have time where I can do prevention. We don't do this well in the U.S. Uh, so a lot of times my patients, when they come to see me, need prevention, but at the same time they have chronic issues that I must take care of. They have acute issues where there's a flare. So all of this thing is often happening almost every visit. It's my job to keep that in mind. Even though you didn't come here for prevention, is there something appropriate I should bring up? Even though you came here for an acute thing, I noticed that one of your chronic conditions needs some attention. So my job is to prioritize on the fly as I go through that, keeping all of these variables in mind. So obviously medications um, often connect many members of the team, and so I try to ensure that true medication reconciliation is what happens, that it is our responsibility. And I just want to ask, yeah. is that phrase common here, medication reconciliation? I, I want to challenge us just for a moment the difference between medical or medication history and medication reconciliation. I think that what we do in our system much more often is medication history taking, and by that I mean we have a list of proposed what we think they're on, we have some kind of communication with the patient or their family member, and then we decide that that is the current thing that they're actually taking. So that's a history, that is what they're doing. We hope that that is correct based on here's what's been filled, here's what the uh, primary care office says, here's what happened the last time they were in the emergency room or hospital, and we put all of those lists together to come up with something we believe is what they're actually really taking. The question is, is that what they should be taking, not that's what they are taking. No. I think that's the difference between history and reconciliation. We then apply an evidence-based approach to that medication regimen and say, okay, for this individual with their creatinine clearance, with their liver function, with their ability to pay for their medications, at least in our country, is this the best regimen for them? And then we reconcile with our partner and say, so here's what I think would be the best thing for this person given all of these variables. Yeah. One quick thing, I want to do a time check just to be sure nobody gets annoyed, because when we realize we're between you and food, we were before food and after food. Um, because we started about 15 minutes late, I'm assuming we get that 15 minutes added at the end. So very good. So Dara's giving me the thumbs up. So d don't y'all freak out. That means we're done one-ish and food awaits. So please don't, don't be too upset with us. Um, so when we look at this, the relationships, this is key for me as a family doc. It's all about relationships and stories. And that doesn't mean other people don't do it. But I know that in, in our country, this is really classic for the general practitioner, the family physician, the general pediatrician, the general internist. Um, it's relationships, it's stories, it's developing this over time. Now, one of the challenges we have is that when we interact with people, how many of you occasionally find people annoying? <laughs> exactly. Uh, never us, of course. But there's this challenge that people don't understand you or they'll say something that's totally bonkers. And I have learned uh, when I was in my training for the American Academy of Family Physicians, this is a mantra I have found invaluable. Assume good intent, which is incredibly hard to do. When somebody does something that just really upsets you, that seems crazy, to, to pause and say, I'm sure they meant well, is hard to do. But especially in medicine, we need to do that. As an example, we have the, the faxed form uh, challenging a med choice. It's hard for me at that moment to think anything other than how annoying the pharmacist has sent me this form telling me what I must do. On the other hand, to say, you know, I, of course this won't happen to me because I know the people, I, but I could say, you know, but I know Brian, I know he's looking after the best. There must be some reason for this that I don't understand. Before I judge, let me ask. That is so hard to do, but if you can do that, even once or twice, it gets easier. It's such a key thing because miscommunication is so easy and being respectful is so critical. And uh, I, I'm afraid a lot of our leaders nowadays have lost the ability to be respectful and open and tolerant. So that means we have to do it. And this is really critical in healthcare. Um, I think one thing that I have found to be helpful when there's a disagreement, 
about whatever it is, is the moment you step back and say, hey, remember, we're all in this to help our patients, to really bring it back to patient-centeredness. I know that sounds like that can't work. It does. The moment you do that with healthcare, it actually works because we really are all, all there to help patients. So the moment we're arguing about whatever it is, scope or decisions, wait a minute, we got to give the best care to our patients, it can break down some of those silos that happen in communication. So how many people are familiar with John Cotter? Great. Let me teach just a little bit. So I, I learned about this gentleman. So this is a professor at Harvard who has, is based, one of the things, is based on the theory of change and specifically change in large organizations. So I, I began reading about his work and I said, you know, he probably has some things to teach us in health systems, in colleges of pharmacy and medicine. And there are two things that uh, in his eight-step approach that sort of stood out. Number one, creating a sense of urgency. So he clearly articulates, if we don't think there's a need to change, something's on fire, we have to do something different, we usually don't. What causes change is pain. For it to hurt so much that if you keep doing it the same, it will hurt more than if you change. That's a sense of urgency. The second thing that he strongly suggests after creating a team that is passionate and is leading the way is that you gotta make sure to create some wins early on so that the team that's been collected sees a path forward and sees a way that this change that you are kind of envisioning actually has wheels and is movable and is doable. And so the two things that we have articulated greatly in our interprofessional education program as well as changing practice is number one, making sure that everybody agrees that we really do need to change. It's time, it's actually past time. And second, finding opportunities for little wins to then come back and celebrate, viciously celebrate, so that you can get a few more people into that circle, so that you can make that circle bigger, so that you can move forward. Another voice that we uh, have listened to that went through in a bad way is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and he's written several books that we tap into. One is that we call this Tipping Points. Um, and so a lot of his concepts, I think, can be engaged in this process of change and how does it get there. I've already mentioned that we have several things coming together lately that we think are a tipping point. I will personally call out uh, Dr. Bishop because she and Dr. Paul Stanton were a tipping point for another major change toward a commitment. Um, all of these things, and, and the, the two deans in terms of your constant commitment from the ground floor toward interprofessional, all these are tipping points that have led us to a point right now that's really important. The other concept that Gladwell talks about is blink, and there are a lot of things in that that I find fascinating and fun, but this concept of the 10,000 hours, um, that that's sort of a step toward mastery. And, and many of you in this room have gotten to this point. It may not just be in our profession. It may be as a musician, as a craftsman, um, as a parent. Um, although many of us would also say that 10,000 hours is never nearly enough to be mastered any of these things. But it's still a concept that we'll come back to. So I want to readdress, at least for the American healthcare system, that I'm pretty sure that we do have a sense of urgency. So I would like for you to leave with four numbers. Three, four, seven, four, seven, 250,000. Say those to yourself. Three, in a recent Lancet article, yes, Lancet, so I'm still trying to understand why in the best assessment of the US health system in the literature, it was not done in JAMA and not done in New England Journal, but it was done in the Lancet, so you guys must be more concerned about our system's problems than we are, but, what that article said was that medical error and medication error was the leading subcategory of medical error was the number three reason for mortality in the United States. Now just let that sink in for a second. That means other than cardiovascular disease and cancer, we, the healthcare system, are most successful at killing people. To put numbers around that, that represents four 747s falling out of the sky every day of every week of every month of every year. Now just put your head around that for a second. 
What that means is 250,000 people a year dying at our hands in our system as a result of medical error. We have a report from the Institute of Medicine that is now 15 plus years old that said to change error in our system, we need to re-look at how communication yeah. and teams provide care. And 15 years later, we are still having this discussion. So I would argue if this isn't urgency, um, we're really struggling to understand fire underneath of us. So a lot of this is, is really important to keep in mind because as we said, um, how much evidence is enough? 15 years later, we still have a lot of evidence. Is it enough? Exposure does not equal expertise. We've been exposed to interprofessional care since Kellogg uh, in 1991, and we think we're pretty good at it, but then here we are now talking about the latest, greatest step. So we might have some expertise, but it may not be what we thought. How many of you have heard this phrase, practice makes? Say that loud. Okay, no, we'd like to believe that. It makes it permanent. So if you practice the same thing badly, um, you're getting that permanently ingrained. Um, and this is really, when, when we heard this recently, it's like, oh my God, that is so true. Because we're practicing things that we think might be interprofessional, but it doesn't make it perfect, it makes it permanent. And this has been a big part of our journey. We've been doing team and interprofessional care that we have, have, have been able to document and get money to do, and we've done it well. And we're getting presentations, and yet we're still here going, now we've got a great idea. Uh, because we've been doing it, still trying to get it right. I think we're much closer. I do think that tipping point is there. I think we've got things in place. But it's a real interesting f aspect. So what we want to uh, end with is what kind of changes need to occur in practice <coughs> and in training or education to move us more away from the aspirational into the implementation. So. First, we need, as we've discussed, we need to shift from a student or employee mentality to a professional. So ultimately, these patients are all our responsibility. Each one of us who touches these patients in whatever form or fashion are responsible. And if we agree to being part of a team that is ultimately responsible for this grandmother's care, I think we will look at them differently than if we look at them as an employee of a system. And therefore, this is, I think, this is something that all profession uh, educational programs are struggling with. How do we inculcate professionalism? Right? It's way beyond the knowledge that we teach you. It's about your commitment to this person who is somebody's family member. It, it is that issue. So we must be involved where the change is happening so that we can impact what change happens instead of the change happening to us. One aspect of that that's important in my organization, which represents over 130,000 family physicians, we recognize that some of us had to get out of the patient room into the board room. Because unless you're part of that conversation where decisions are made, the decisions that are made often seem crazy. Um, and this is hard because it's not for everybody, but that's a big part of what we're describing there in order to be part of these changes that are happening. So the care delivery and the payment models, as we've discussed, they have to change. But the, the, the way that care will change is when money is somewhere over here. And so what we have tried to do is create models in our systems that can use payment models as they exist, coddle together grant funding, and then show in demonstration projects how this is going to improve care better than what the common model is. That definition of community. So we have used this word multiple times, and I think at least in America, the definition of a community pharmacist is a, a pharmacist that is in a retail setting, is a pharmacist in a store-based setting, a distributive pharmacist. I want to change the idea of a community pharmacist, that mm -hmm. everyone who has gone to pharmacy school is a community pharmacist. Every pharmacist has a community of people that they must care for. Mm -hmm. If we go back to this idea that we are professionals, that we're not employees, that there is a population or a community that we all are responsible to. And so we're all community pharmacists. We're all community practitioners. We're all community providers. And the question is how we align those 
um, morals, ethics with the other practitioners so that we can do this in harmony and not um, kind of separated. So some of what we need to do as we make these changes is to become so patient-centered that we actually, what is it that our patients need? Not what we can do or what we think they need. Uh, some of the um, recent terms we've heard that we really appreciate uh, is the EI, everyone included, um, or nothing about us without us. Because we're talking about patients and they're not part of our conversation somewhere, we're gonna mess up because we're gonna make an assumption that's based on us. Um, I feel very strongly and have had a career where I can promise you this is true. Relationships make systems work better. There's so many examples I can give of how you think you're just a small cog in a big system, um, but you've all developed a reputation, you've worked hard, you have credit. Um, these relationships can make decisions and discussions work better. And another really important concept, most hurdles are lower than you think. There are so many things where people say no or but. And the reality is these hurdles aren't that high. Um, we often make them a lot higher and they're easy to jump over them, especially in terms of relationships. Nurture them, develop them, use them. This is really key. And you don't have to wait for a memo. Please don't wait for an organization to tell you, please develop relationships. Because they won't happen. And in fact, there'll be some that say, please stop that. You know, don't, don't do that, because systems know that the best way to make changes is through individuals, relationships, processes, conversations. The best way to mess with people is keep them afraid, keep them siloed. And I'm not saying our organizations are necessarily that way, but how many of you know an organization that you think is somewhat malicious? I certainly know a few, and sadly, many of them do impact the care I provide. So a really important aspect. So from a training standpoint, I think that um, both Reed and I can speak watching the change of training. So I spent the first 20 years of my life trying to change practice from the inside, going into practices, creating an, an embedded practice, and changing a culture one building and group of physicians at a time. And there was a point where I sort of you know, had one of these big uh, coconut on the head realizations that if, if I were more involved at the learner level and we created expectations in the graduates that they would be our change agents instead of us having to change each individual practice. And so I think it's really important that as a couple of people said this morning, sitting beside each other in a classroom is not interprofessional, it's interdisciplinary. There are several trainees sitting, getting a lecture, Typically, if you give them the option, all of the medical students will sit over here, the pharmacy students will sit here, etc. There must be great intentionality that makes sure that they uh, are not beside each other, but they are embedded with each other. That they are put into groups and they are forced to, uh, to solve problems and to learn that um, just because I don't know everything, there probably is a little piece that I'm going to bring that's going to be unique and provide that confidence in a safe environment to allow them to flourish. And finally, that this will improve collaboration and the quality of care. We believe that firmly. The more times that these students can see this really. So I talked to several people in the audience at the break about um, it's really important that these practices say and do what we tell the learners we ought to do. I'm sure anyone who's involved in education, the, the biggest disconnect that you can do is tell a student something and then go show them something the exact opposite because they will come back and not trust anything you say after that. Right? So having professional practices that we can show them how this actually really works so that then they can see for themselves and to be um, a, a bigger advocate for going out and changing when they graduate. And finally, because of this, the, the silos are, are broken down. Yeah. And a lot of this is through uh, the relationship changes. We all know, how many of you think we need to change things? By the way, I do this to keep you awake because it's getting warm in here and other things. So, um, and, and this is really about our relationships and it's really an honor to be, again, the token physician. Thank you again for, for being here. You're feeling good, aren't you? We're feeling welcome. I noticed you're right near the door though, just in case, yeah. Um, but uh, 
you know, the reality is we have to have a different relationship. We've got to learn to work together. It's been a fascinating journey as I've worked with Brian as we go around because it, it's, it's something that's, that's very interesting and inculcated that needs change. So we have talked just very briefly about our quick wins. So going back to the Cotter model, what, what, what things happened that, that sort of gave us a little bit of momentum? And the, the first is, um, so Keep going. up in the left-hand corner is what Dr. Bishop mentioned, this capstone event for our first group of interprofessional team learners. So as she mentioned, we created a system that used the interprofessional um, domains as the learning places. These were individualized instead of done in teams. And then we brought these, these students together at the farm and did a um, simulated refugee experience. Now what we learned was that um, we thought this was great as we were watching this unfold and we had mannequins so there was a uh, a uh, tree that had fallen down on one of the refugees and they ended up losing their leg and they bled out and they died. There was a pregnant person who died in childbirth. It, it was horrible, it was <laughs> atrocious. And all the faculty, as they watched this happen, we, all of them thought, oh, isn't this magnificent? It's marvelous, it's fantastic. And when we did the debrief with the students, they said, that was absolutely horrible. <laughs> and what we learned was, that we hadn't prepared them for that at all. We had provided them this core material and in no way said, so if you were in a situation like this, here's how you might want to do things. And that caused us to stop and pause and say, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And what are we trying to make? And so we took a year off and put no students through and kind of retreated took a group of faculty to an away meeting, spent a week together, yeah. um, uh, had Indian food on my birthday in Washington, yeah. D.C., and really bonded. And that group came back and became the steering committee for the interprofessional education um, uh, experience round two. What you see in the bottom corner is the next group that came through. And the difference was that we now put these groups, we put these students into interprofessional teams that experienced education over a two-year longitudinal experience in the same group. And then what we saw was relationships being built and bonding happening. And suddenly relationships became the focus of this experience as opposed to some um, refugee thing out in the woods that everybody wanted to kill all the faculty over. What you saw then were, were these um, discussions between students about how they were going to move to some place together as a group and practice together. They were having debates on who was missing from their team when they moved to a, a city uh, an hour or so away. We began to see that um, creating teams and forcing them through an experience over a two year period of time forced them to rely on one another in ways that I don't even think we were prepared for when we watched it develop. What we did is we, we did create these teams that are professional, facilitated by interprofessional faculty, um, and we really kind of made it up as we went along, but put, put folks in together to solve problems. Some of these were team exercises, some were communication exercises, some were simulated patients in which we uh, created opportunities for our teams to go in and do some of that work. Uh, the challenge we have right now is we now have trained a group of students, and these are medical students that are, are getting ready to start their clinical rotations, and they're going to go into the clinics and not find what we taught them. This is a real challenge for us right now, but it's a good one. It's, it's that sense of urgency because these students are gonna go say, where is this? And we're gonna have to admit it's not there yet, but you as a student can be a voice for this change. So it's, it's a really interesting and dynamic process, um, but it's really working out. We really feel pretty good about this. And then finally, I think this all culminated. Our, our new capstone event was um, a, a much more pageantry and showing significance. And so this is a local leader of our largest health system in our area. This is Mr. Tony Keck. He is the chief um, development, development officer. officer. Yeah. I can never remember the D. De chief development officer for the, for the uh, um, 
Mountain States Health Alliance system. So he came from the world and said, I want you to understand that what you guys just have done for the last two years is, as an employer, what we are looking for. It validated what they had just gone through. And as Dr. Bishop said, we provided graduation cords so that when they walk in their individual programs ceremonies, they will have a unique cord that sets them apart that everybody will ask, what is that white cord? And they will be able to explain what the uniqueness was of this experience. So a lot of this is about relationships. It really is about how do we create a different model as two individuals. Um, and I think we try to role model the trust and respect that we're asking, but we're also role modeling that we're dedicated about patient care. And I think that's really important. The people who are moving you forward need to have that reputation, need to have a history of actually walking your talk. Um, it doesn't mean you can't change the talk, but you better change the walk at the same time. And that's where we are. We're working on a lot of those kinds of issues. And as I said, it's, it's up to you. These are things that you can indeed do. Um, I think the ultimate goal here and the way I encapsulate some of this in team-based care is patients deserve the right care in the right place at the right time from the right person and the right team member. And if you think about this and you look and see what is your current system, where are we falling down, you'll often find it's in one of these places. Wrong care, wrong time, chronic management in the ER. Um, that's also uh, often the wrong place and the wrong person. All of this is a challenge. So if you keep this in mind and look at your system, are we doing this? I think this can help you identify where your challenges are. So we, Dr. Bishop began with the end in mind and said, this is our future home. So we, we want to tell you what we're most excited about at ETSU, and that is Building 60. So we are in the process of renovating a beautiful, of our standards, old building. Uh, it was built in the turn of the century, late, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so again, I recognize it's just a bewit small, young building from uh, Irish standards, but to us it's a beautiful old building. And, wh and what is going to happen in this building is we're going to take a building that had been the place where all supplies for the veterans in this location came <coughs> in, and all of those supplies then were, were parceled out to all of the patients on this campus. That was 100 plus years ago. What we hope this becomes is the place where all students will then come, are trained, and then parceled out to go make a change. So the symbolism is not lost on us at all. Two floors that we are focused on is a simulated ambulatory experience that would include a, an outpatient physician's office, an outpatient pharmacy, a uh, patient's house, so a simulated uh, living quarters for the patient, and then similarly on a second floor, an acute care setting, so a, an ICU, birthing suite, those kinds of things, a step-down unit, and a simulated IV room. So the idea would be that there will certainly be, as Dr. Bishop said very well, vertical opportunities for simulation for unique skills for a given profession. But there will also be a focus on taking those skills and putting them into a horizontal experience that trains these students together to see these different places of care being put together and seeing how a team would improve this in a safe environment before they go out to the world. The challenge here, as we finish up, is we're showing you right now a lot of the, uh, the what and the how. You know, what are we doing in a professional how? We've got this cool new building. The challenge for us is, is rethinking this model. And this is really something that we're starting to coalesce as Brian and I continue to, to work together on this. Because there's a, a really important concept that uh, uh, Simon Sinek, who hopefully it's going to show up here in a minute now, um, <laughs> has talked about it, and it's talking about why as being the center point. And so much of what we do, and what we are showing you right now, is a lot of what and how. It's just easy. So our challenge, our challenge, is rethinking some of this as everything hits this tipping point, as everything is coming together with a lot of excitement to really answer what's our why. And so part of our why is our system doesn't work. 
uh, in its current model. And we're doing this because we truly do want to be patient-centered and team-based in a way that has impact. And if that's our why, then the what and the how can sort of fall along behind it. But it's so easy to get back into how and what, because that's a grant, it's a building, it's a new title, it's a new designation, it's pulling students together. And, and we're still struggling with that. But I would challenge you that that's one of your key messages. Why do you want to make a change? What's your sense of urgency? Where are your quick wins? What relationships do you have that you can use? Which ones do you need that you can generate? And how are you going to, as an individual, move that forward? Because each of you is here for a reason. I'd love to go around and say, why are you here? You're spending hours sitting in a room listening to somebody. Why? Um, and hopefully you've got some very powerful answers. And so we appreciate being a chance of stimulating some of those questions more so than providing answers. Because what we have is just something that is working. And as you've heard, many of the things we've tried that we're proud of didn't work so good. And we're going to try them better the next time. And that's the other part of this. Pay attention. Do this rapid cycle quality improvement. Did it work? If not, why not? What do we do different? And move forward. But we appreciate your time. Um, and hopefully there's still a little bit of time for some questions if you have them. And Dara has a microphone. is next. Yeah I, yeah, I know. I realize that. And it's warm. But the sun has moved. We are, there we go. I'm the chair of the Heartbeat Trust, and I used to be a, a senior civil servant. One of the comments I'd make about your presentation is that you've, you're really describing a new environment for the training of health professionals. Because we train all of our health professionals in this country and other countries in the hollowed quarters of tertiary and quaternary centers. And then we expect them to go out and practice in a totally different environment. <clears throat> so I think it's, it's very, your presentation is very important and very timely. In my time at the Department of Health, we tried to create <clears throat> the concept of a primary care academic teaching center so that we could compete in terms of the training of health professionals with the major hospitals because all of our professionals are trained in that environment, and some of them in, in a model that's out of date. Now, the other thing, I know, uh, I think uh, Dr. Bishop in particular uh, identified the issues around the smartphone. We've had the telephone for 135 years. It's been my submission for many years that outpatients, as a model that we use in the Western world, is a redundant system of the 1800s where we brought our parents and our grandparents because the sanitation wasn't great, the, the nutrition wasn't great. And then we created this hollowed quarter called a hospital, and we designed it about the professionals who worked in the hospital and about their time and their availability. So the fact that patients might have 24 seven hour requirements 365 days a year doesn't really matter. So I look forward to you demonstrating in your, in your, in your new environment that actually you can create a, an impetus which will, if you like, tackle the legacy of decades, the legacy of centuries, which I think is fundamentally based on a, a model of care, based on t secondary and tertiary and quaternary care. And one final point um, that struck me about your presentation is um, you spoke about it being patient-centered and that what I think you put up on one slide what does the patient need? Now, th this is something that we really need to come to grips with yeah. because you can have felt needs and you can have demands. Yes. But ultimately, the health professional needs to be able to distinguish those f from the normative need of, of, of people um, in terms of their visit to a health professional. I wish you very, every, every success. And, and I, I know you're, you'll be successful but I just wanted to be a bit provocative by saying you're taking on a legacy of a couple of hundred years. Good luck to you. <laughs> uh, I like that. I guess one, one aspect of that, you're exactly right. Um, and what we're presenting now is a culmination of a lot of pieces that are in place, but a, a true germination and start of this process was our individual and independent recognitions of 
a, a philosophical change to really move in the direction you're describing, away from the sanctuaries, keeping people in their communities. And then when we were um, in the same city, being able to have him come and teach and then be in the practice before we had a lot of this in place, gave us a chance to demonstrate in a tertiary setting for our learners without a formal curriculum, ways that we could interact. And, and I really think that's helped us get recognitions and monies because somebody says, there's something weird here. Um, and I think weird can be exciting. Um, so when you're really wanting to, to knock at the, the, the castle door and, and get recognized, the more unusual you appear, the more likely it is somebody to let you in. Um, and that's really what we're hopeful for, is that we keep getting into the systems <laughs> in a way that let us start to make those changes. And it is profound. Thank you for recognizing there's absolutely no pressure or challenge involved in this. <laughs> um, it's reassuring. Thank you. I feel much better now. Yeah. <laughs> While we're waiting for another question, uh, another aspect of that is to recognize the new technology. And that's why the smartphone is so important because in our country, even patients who are economically limited often have a smartphone. And we have been very uncomfortable as a profession in managing things non-face-to-face. -face, and yet we have generations now that are used to it. And in fact, if you don't offer it, won't seek you out. And one of our challenges for siloed care is that if I can't be patient-centered and be there, whether you send me a note on the portal, send me a text or a phone call and get you in to meet, and some of these are demands rather than needs, but how do we negotiate to that spot? They'll go somewhere else. They'll go to the ER, they'll go to an urgent care, they'll go to other silos rather than what we're trying to do. And this is a real challenge because I, I deal with a lot of folks who have similar colored hair who uh, are not happy with smartphones and Twitter and all of those things. And to get them used to even answering an encrypted email on the electronic record is a hurdle. So some very real challenges. That was, uh, I think, an exceptional presentation by Drs. Blackwelder and Cross. It leads us up to lunch, which you're invited to in the college boardroom. We're going to make up for lost time and it. be back here at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. All right.